Gary, thank you very much for taking the time today. It's great to see you. Uh, I was delighted to see you announced as a speaker for Collision. Myself and Tom have been interviewing a handful of Collision speakers in the lead up to the event. And I don't think there's a more important topic than the one we're going to speak about today. Obviously, we know that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is still going on. We know that war is primarily fought on the ground, but it's also fought online. We really wanted to talk about the digital aspects of war today uh, and leverage your expertise. So with that in mind, Gary, would you be able to talk to us about how emerging technologies are transforming the information warfare we're seeing nowadays? Oh, thank you very much for having me and uh, raising this very important topic, because I think the, uh, this ongoing war now, it's a first uh, full-scale cyber war as well. That is not very much in the news, because it's not uh, uh, something you can visualize. But we know it's, it's a logical continuation of the war on the free world Vladimir Putin launched a uh, long time ago. Uh, you can't imagine any um, campaign today any political campaign, any ideological campaign, not being accompanied by social media, uh, by new technology. And of course, you know, when we say new technology and social media, we mean disinformation, misinformation, and all sorts of malign components of, of uh, political campaigns. But Vladimir Putin, and we have to give him credit, um, somehow pioneered new methods whether it's him or his regime. So I just say for the, for, for just to make, to make it shorter. But um, I remember that nearly two decades ago, it's 2004, 2005, uh, Putin's regime came up with a revolutionary technology of not simply blocking opposition activities online. It's not Chinese con concept of firewall, but uh, doing something the opposite. Why not to offer you abundance of information? Oh, okay. This is, you can read this. You can read that. Basically, instead of trying to sell you one truth only, as newspaper Pravda did it, or nine o'clock news in the Soviet Union, and by the way, nine o'clock news now in Russia, but they tried to offer you many versions of truth. Nobody knows the truth. Uh, maybe we're not so good. Nobody is good. Yeah. Have we falsified elections? Yes, but everybody did so. And uh, I always called Putin merchant of doubt. Mm. And that's exactly, I think, is the, uh, the idea of, of the information warfare in modern times. It's not about convincing you to buy an ideology. It's not telling you this is the only truth that you, you must buy or, you know, we're enemies. No, it's annihilating the truth. It's creating an illusion that, eh, it's we all are equally bad or equally good. It doesn't matter. Um, and uh, I have to say that the free world was not ready for this challenge. While Putin had many iterations of polishing this, this mechanism, this tool, it started in, the, in Russia by addressing millions and millions of newcomers to Russian Internet uh, with uh, websites that looked legit from liberal point of view. Oh, they had tons of news. But... Instead of having one page that you know, tells you the, their story, they found a way to split it. It's like mm -hmm. Voldemort's lives. You, know, that's, you, can, you, can, you can actually have them you know, just split here and there. So the first newcomers to, 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 uh, to the social media, they saw this website, this website, this website, and they, they got addicted because you don't push too many buttons. You, know, you have one of your favorite you know, programs and whether on TV or internet. And... Somehow they, they, they created a massive following. And then they used the same technique for near abroad, it's Russian-speaking universe, e Europe, and eventually the United States. But when Putin successfully attacked American elections, he already had nearly a decade of successful experience of practicing various forms of social media brainwashing. Troll factories, fake news, um, I would call it fake news farms. And, and I have to admit that some of their techniques were absolutely phenomenal. They mm -hmm. could construct a whole conversation, you know, just by the trolls. And it's not simply, oh, you bad guys. No, no, no. Somebody could say, oh, Gary Kasparov, great chess player. Yeah, I always was his fan, but 
I think he's doing something wrong now. And somebody else comes in saying, yeah, but he's a traitor. No, somebody, the third one is, is defending. It. And they create the entire conversation is a fake, but it looks so natural. And that's where we are now. It's, um, it's when people ask about difference between disinformation and misinformation. It's a, it's a problem. It's a misinformation because, again, it's not a simple lie. It's basically, you know, strong message that truth cannot be known. And, you know, you can go anywhere in this world, but you still have to be satisfied with half truths, quarter truths. And, and that's exactly the muddy water that makes dictator feels very comfortable. Jeez, it's really interesting hearing you talk about the tactics that are involved in this. And I think you hear things like disinformation, misinformation, fake news, the role that social media has played in troll factories, in manufacturing conversations that might be between bots or just made up people, which then start to, to spiral. And you've seen the impact of all of this all around the world. Um, I'm wondering how you qualify and distinguish between misinformation and disinformation. And then also in a world where it's hard to know what the truth is now, because all of this exists, where should people be looking to get their news from? The line between disinformation and misinformation, you know, it could be even semantic, you know, the line is too blurry. But I still would, you know, if we want to, 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 to understand the difference or to, if we insist on having, the, having this difference, I would say that disinformation is, is uh, more of just, it's, it's, it's a combination of lies. It's, it's an attempt to actually to push you in the wrong direction. It's, it's something that has, has a clear message. So it's like, you know, it's, it's a poison spearhead. Well, misinformation is, ah, it's just, you know, it's this, you can go here, you can go there. You can, mis disinformation actually has an agenda, push you in, in certain direction. Misinformation is basically, oh, it's a kingdom of convex mirrors, you know, welcome. You can look at this one at this one. So, and I think misinformation is in our order of life. It's far more dangerous because it creates an illusion of choice. But when we are at war, as now, so that definitely disinformation becomes an element because it's a war. And as here, you know, you have sometimes you have very concrete targets to, to hit. Gary, you talked a little bit about social media there and the, and the rise of it. And then obviously how Russia and China are different. China has the, the great firewall. What does social media look like in Russia? Do, do they have access to all the platforms or, or is it state controlled? As of now, it's, it's very simple. I mean, it's the no more subtleties. All, all I said about, you know, technologies that they embraced uh, in 2004, 2005, tricks, you know, troll factories. It's no longer, it's no longer scalpel. It's simple acts. You know, just, mm -hmm. just cut everything, you know, just this. Uh, and, um, and it's clear because it's a war and regime lost its flexibility. It doesn't care anymore about, you know, debating, even, even having fake debates. As of Putin's, Putin's social media in Russia, it's now, it's, it's, it's linear. It's back to Stalin's days. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple, very primitive. So Ukrainians are fascists. Putin is a white knight. Uh, Mother Russia is under attack. America is trying to destroy us. I mean, it's, it's the most primitive. And, and it's, it's, it's clinical form of propaganda, which is amazing because, you know, you think that it's 21st century. People have access to information. This mm -hmm. is not, you know, days of Hitler and Stalin where you, you had to hunt for information by trying your homemade radio just to, to, to hear the voices shop from abroad. You can verify that it's all lie. Uh, but somehow, you know, this is again, we're dealing with another interesting psychological effect. Even those in Russia who could easily find that nine o'clock news and all the talk shows, they lie. They prefer not to be convinced by the other side. Because the moment you understand that you are part of the country that has been committing genocide, that is carrying war crimes on an industrial scale, and you could look at images of Bucha or other places, or Mariupol, you have to do something. So somehow, a lot of my compatriots prefer to say, we don't support a war, but... War is tough. This is, by the way, it moves to the misinformation territory. Yes, but we know Putin is lying, but probably they're also lying. Those are the poisonous fruits of Putin's misinformation campaign. Because a lot of people say, yeah, we know Putin is, yeah, that's terrible. No, not impossible. But 
maybe they also exaggerate just you know to sell these 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 this, this stories horror stories and to uh, change our mind so everybody's lying that's one of the greatest challenges how do we find source of information that is reliable and i'm afraid there's no clear answer it's not you know it's not 2 plus 2 equals 4 so you go there you unfortunately it depends very much on our ability to process data mm. and 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 find i wouldn't say common denominator it's more like you know some sort of average you know so is the if you want to know more about american politics i think you should have cnn and fox two screens open and then you just and then to start balancing because yeah you hear one story you hear another story but it's it's very individual i don't think it's bad because that's what we want we want people to be to feel free so that's the whole idea of new technology whether it's uh, it's our device you know or you know or, or bitcoin so the idea is that as an individuals we have more freedom to to control our lives and that means we have to be more responsible for digesting or vomiting uh, information that we receive it's funny you just gave the example of fox news and cnn i've done that a few times where there's been breaking news and i'd have both on just to see how they report on that and share that and oftentimes uh the same story can be told in obviously a very different tone or or be seen through a different lens i can even say that because i do it all the time you know uh yes yeah, some top stories yeah of course you know that's you have stories you know, from the white house or some tragedies like the shooting in texas they have different opinions but many stories they are just they come from different sources you know sometimes i have an an, an impression that you have two tv channels talking about two different countries by the way they're not even lying they simply pick up stories they just the, the the selection of the stories could create absolutely different environment in your head mm-hmm. so which is quite quite amazing again i'm not talking about you know just tucker carlson versus rachel meadow i mean this is i'm right. just you know talking about news simple selection of news could actually give you totally different impression about what's happening in the country same country at the same time again without any ideological cover up it just you know it's i want to emphasize this and you want to emphasize this and somehow we think are we still in the same country <laughs> so that's pretty wild too because at least as an outsider you've heard that in russia anybody that was presenting a side of the war that was not in line with putin has been sort of shut down and that it's become even more shut down insular. shut down is a very diplomatic phrase it's okay. <laughs> you can end up in, in in prison for 15 years and we already have oh. few cases criminal cases because for saying war not special military operation spe- saying war you can actually get 3 years in prison now if you are talking about you know oral or kafka welcome to putin's russia in that environment and in the time in this cyber warfare that's taking place what does this look like for somebody that's in russia versus somebody that is in ukraine and how is that news different you are talking to someone who left russia 10 years ago nearly 10 years ago facing imminent arrest so that's why i have to always you know make this adjustment though i follow this news closely you know we have all sorts of sources you know we we try to analyze the data that we receive from russia but still i'm not there so and that's the and that's why you know i can make educated guesses or psychological assessments mm-hmm. but you know, it's very difficult to actually to get in the minds of people who are who live inside Russia one thing is that you know i i always you know tell people do not take polls that are being published in Russia seriously for a simple reason people who live in totalitarian countries they mm-hmm. don't want to be frank with strangers if you got a call from a stranger saying oh what do you think about a war in ukraine and how are these putin doing i bet you 9 out of 10 hang up they just they don't want to be involved so that's just in this conversation um so in russia today i think it's just, it's the it's, we went backward it's decades it's probably not even brezhnev time it's 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 back to stalin's days now you look at the ukrainian side again i'm more comfortable giving an assessment because I talk regularly to Ukrainian news programs. I uh follow them and uh um and they definitely they try to be far more objective because it's it's a free country. Though it's it's so it's under siege now in war, at war but still you can hear very different voices and naturally it's it's a strong resentment to anything Russian. So mm-hmm. I I I understand if some of the Ukrainian pr- presenters on TV they ask me to be questioned in in Ukrainian which I can handle. 
So, and I, I, I answer Russian, but I understand their, their unwillingness even to speak Russian. So the, what we're seeing now in Ukraine is it might have very tragic consequence for my country because um, it's like Germany in 1945. So it's, it's, you, it's not just, you know, Nazi regime, but it's, it's a whole country and the whole culture that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, for at least for a time being could be uh, denied access to, to the rest of the world. It's just, it's very difficult to make, to, to separate. So it's, this is Russian language and, uh, and, and, and uh, war and peace uh, uh, from Bucha, from uh, genocide, from deportations, from uh, deliberate uh, attacks on, on civilians. It's, we are now facing quite a moment for, uh, for the future uh, of my country, Russia, and Ukraine and other former Soviet republics. Yeah. Because... The crimes committed now by Putin's regime in Ukraine, they will not perish from public mind after, after Putin's regime collapses. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a stigma that is just, you know, it it's, will we'll, we'll stick to everyone with, with Russian citizenship, myself included. Though I think very few people, if any, could have you know, just a longer and more... Uh, uh, aggressive record of, of opposing Putin's, Putin's regime. Mm-hmm. But still, you know, there's a collective guilt. And yeah. then there's individual way out. That's what I'm all saying, you know. Yeah, forget the war criminals. Putin, uh, Shoigu, his ministers, uh, and those who are giving orders, criminal orders, and committing crimes, crimes in Ukraine. But you still have 95% of people who are technically not in, involved in these crimes. And many of them say, oh, I'm against the war. Uh, that's not enough. If you want to, to have clear conscience, and if you want to look in the eyes of your children, and, if, and, and later on, if you want to be part of the, of the civilized world, you have to do more than saying, I'm, 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 I'm against the war now. And that's why um, the group I'm working with, we came up with this declaration, very simple declaration, stating three things. War is criminal. Regime is illegitimate. And Ukraine is a whole. You have to acknowledge territorial sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine. So those are the simple things we can do. What I said, that to separate ourselves from cannibals. We just mm-hmm. don't want to be part of that. It's a big, big, big challenge. I know it's, it's, it has nothing to do with, with, with cyber uh, uh, topics we discuss now. But while talking about computers, I always remind people that we humans have monopoly for evil. Mm-hmm. And it's no matter how great technology is. At the end of the day, it's about who is operating it and what kind of, what kind of goal that is being, being designed for this specific technology. So true. You talked about collective guilt there, Gary. Can you, can you explain exactly what that is or, or what are the ways around that coming out of this war? Yeah, look, you know, it's the, I, mean, I know how many great Germans felt in the 30s. Yeah, they had to leave country. I mean, whether it was uh, Thomas Mann, Marlene Dietrich, Albert Einstein, so the long list of great, great personalities. I, what I feel now is just maybe I have not worked hard enough to prevent it from happening. Did I have a chance? Not so much. But still, you know, you all, we all have to feel it. Because at the end of the day, we just have to find a way out of this. You may call it dead end or, or as a swamp or it's abyss, but it's just... You have to bring country back. And for that, you need to recognize that it's more than Putin. That's what mm-hmm. we're dealing now in, in Ukraine is more than just, you know, one evil man. Yes, he's, it's, it's, it's a new Hitler. And by the way, now I'm, I'm quite happy to say that because 10 years ago, I was nearly kicked out at many occasions when I compared Putin to Hitler during the Sochi Olympics. And I remember just, well, actually one was a Canadian journalist. She literally walked, I mean, she wanted to walk away. She just made, because I compared 1936 Olympics to Sochi. And she was so angry at me mm-hmm. saying, how could you compare Putin to Hitler? And I said, ma'am, Hitler 1936 was not Hitler from 1941, mm-hmm. not from Hitler from history books. And if you don't trust me, you can read Canadian papers, American papers, British papers, French papers. And the reason I'm telling you about this comparison, because I want us to work hard to make sure that Putin 2014 will not become Hitler 1941. So, um, but again, it did, it did, it did happen. And, uh, and uh, um, 
while you know we all look at Putin as this as a reincarnation of absolute evil, it's not even you know just his entourage, his inner circle. It's not just you know the KGB as a successor of Soviet communist crimes. I think it's it's the entire Russian history based on the imperial expansion. What I say it's 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 time for us to to um, remove imperial metrics from Russian code of statehood. Can we do it? I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 I'm not here to tell you that it's, 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 it, it will happen when and, 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 and if Ukraine wins the war. But I think that's all only chance. And that's why, you know, it's very important now to use every resource we have to make sure Ukraine wins the war because only full liberation of Ukraine offers chance to liberate Russia from Putin's fascism and to give us a chance to look at our history and find some new new algorithms, how to return to the to the uh, sort of main avenue of civilization. Kerry, you just mentioned during the Sochi Olympics saying something that was probably ahead of its time, um, and it's been proven true in the in the years that followed here now. But the whole conversation has shifted dramatically, um, especially in the last two to three months here. It takes a lot of courage to speak up on those things, and especially in, you know, in years past. And then nowadays, we're just talking about people in the news that I said shut down. You mentioned that's a very diplomatic way of saying it, not so much shut down, sent to jail or, or worse. Um, I'm wondering for yourself, you've, it, I think it takes a lot of courage to speak on these matters because there's obviously a lot of counter pressure to, uh, to subdue those voices um, and you're obviously somebody that is very vocal on these matters. So what advice do you have to other people or perhaps even to other countries or um, to other people that want to get involved in um, changing the way that this is all playing out and that news is consumed and disinformation, misinformation, um, all of these things that we're talking about right now, it, it is a big thing to, to change these tides. I don't know how to do it. I don't know if you know how to do it, but do you have any advice as somebody that has shown a lot of courage to step forth and talk about these things? Again, it's very individual. So it is, there's no universal advice. So we all get together and we, we, we can change things. It's, uh, yeah, more, more the merrier. So that's just, yes, if we have more and more voices, uh, uh, joining the campaign and uh, pushing politicians to recognize the fact that only Ukrainian victory uh, is, 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 offers us uh, a chance for, for a better future. And if Ukraine, God forbid, loses the war or accept, uh, is forced to accept uh, Putin's territorial demands, we, we're going back to the Dark Ages. That's, this is everything that we achieved after World War II about territorial integrity, uh, uh, borders, international cooperation, security, it's all gone. We already had this problem after 2014, but now it's the most blatant form to destroy the world order we used to live in. Um, um, now, I, I've been doing it for, for years, and uh, yeah, I'm in relative safety in New York. Obviously, when I travel around the world, so there's, there's the risk it's, it's, um, is increased. But, uh, you know, I, I do what I believe is right, and I... Uh, I remember, you know, the motto of Soviet dissidents. Uh, so do what you must, and so be it. That's that's this this what that's how I grew up. So I uh, I also remember the um, the poster uh, that uh, that my mother put on, on top of my bed when I was a teenager. If not you, who else? Hmm. So, well, I I think that I can do a lot by raising the awareness about this tragedy and also. You know, pushing people. It's just to telling them that it's Ukraine is fighting for more than just restoring its territorial integrity. It's more than simply uh, defending European security infrastructure. It's a it's it's a front line of a global war between freedom and tyranny, and uh, that's why its outcome will be a decisive factor for the development of mankind of our civilization for years, if not for decades to come. It's fascinating. And I know, Gary, you said that you left Russia about 10 years ago. 
at that time, what were you what were you seeing or feeling on the ground that or was there any catalyst that said, okay, it's time to time to get out of here? And and how do you manage your own personal safety? You've been an outspoken critic about Putin for years, um, which obviously comes with a lot of risk. Leaving Russia was not my first choice. I, I left a country that I, I represented for, for decades. I was arguably one, if not the most uh, decorated athletes in Soviet Russian history. Um, but I knew I, I actually had no choice uh, unless I was ready to, to be arrested. And, uh, and I spoke to my mother uh, because I was actually, I was traveling when we got this call, very friendly call from Russian an analog of FBI, uh, politely asking me to show up and to be a witness on some of the new cases they opened on political opposition. And, uh, and as my late uh, friend and ally, Boris Nemtsov, who was actually shot in Moscow in 2015, told me, over the phone that you enter the building as a witness, and if if you leave the building, you will be the, you most likely will be the suspect. So I discussed with my mother, and we decided it would rather. I mean, for her it was really really bad news. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's devastating. But you know, she knew I would be far more useful being alive and free elsewhere in in America, for instance rather than being, you know, incarcerated in, 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 in Russia. And as for my personal safety, look, people kept asking me, and my answer is, you know, would it help? So w- what's the point of wondering about it? If, if they decide to go after you, no one is safe on this planet. So I just do what I believe is right. And, uh, yeah, I, I try to be cautious. Yes, I don't visit some countries where I believe, you know, my safety could be in real jeopardy, countries where KGB feels very comfortable in operating. And um, recently, you know, just after the beginning of war in Ukraine, at big events, I ask for some, for some security just to, to make sure that it's in a big crowd so I, I'm not uh, uh, accidentally, accidentally uh, harassed or, or attacked. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I walk in New York, you know, and in most other places. At Gary Gosporov, nothing has changed. Well, it's good that you're uh, taking those precautions and uh, glad that you're being safe for sure. It's good that uh, you have this voice that you can share uh, to, to create some of the change that you're talking about. Let's shift gears a little bit for a moment. Um, the hacking group Anonymous, there's somebody that have come forward in support of Ukraine. What type of impact are they making? Um, have you seen anything from their efforts? Tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Anonymous are anonymous, so that's why we can only have an educated guess. Yeah, but as we briefly already discussed, you know, that's the this war is the first full full blown cyber war, and one of the reasons that Russia doesn't have the same attacking capabilities uh, because so people many people worried about Russia attacking Ukraine critical infrastructure, uh, um, the same way that Russia demonstrated its its. Uh, its potential uh, uh, of attacking uh, various targets in the free world uh, before. But it's the first time Russia also has to think about defense. Whoever anonymous are, again, we can only guess, they have been doing a very important work by tying Russian resources uh, to, you know, just to be spent on defense. They attacked so many institutions. By, by the way, the good thing is that when they attacked, for instance, the nuclear plant, it was not about disruption, but it's about stealing data and publishing it. So they st- stole data from many, many websites like, you know, t- top Russian banks and published it. Uh, they paralyzed. I don't know whether they just, you know, they, they ruined completely, but definitely had significant damage to RootTube, the analog of, of, of YouTube in Russia, sponsored by Gazprom. They attacked many um, regional administrations. So um, it's, it's, I'm sure they have serious impact mm-hmm. uh, because it's this, this, with so many attacks, a lot of resources had to be reallocated from attack to, to, to defense because Russia, yeah, Russia is a vast country. And uh, it's the first time that someone gave them the test of their own medicine. Um, mm-hmm. 
But having said that, Russia is still pretty active, and I understand that Ukrainians also are raising funds to, to defend their country against, against uh, Russian attacks, though they are, again, less devastating than could be expected. But um, again, as we speak, I'm sure experts, uh, whether they're in, in just, you know, just they are uh, just um, investigative journalists or um, security experts from big corporations or uh, those who are working for state agencies, I think they are very carefully studying the outcome of this war. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's the first time where we see this real exchange of blows. And... Uh, and it, it will probably, you know, model the, the, the future fights. I have no doubt that from, uh, from Washington to Beijing, yes, all these agencies, and from corporations, whether it's, 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 it's Avast Norton or others, you know, so they're all studying uh, the, the techniques, the damages. So this is, mm -hmm. it's again, welcome to the new world. So it's, this is this more and more of our life is shifting from, uh, uh, real world into digital world, which means, you know, the weapons will also be uh, uh, sharpened to attack the, uh, the, the elements of the digital world that could cause real damage to our, or to our lives. So Gary, you, we were talking about uh, how Anonymous releasing all of this data, and I've seen huge amounts of data, like terabytes of data, personal information from different Russian websites. What happens with this data or who's, who's taking this data and filtering through it or cycling through it or what actually happens as an outcome of this data? I don't know. I mean, this, this, this data is data. Data is like a fuel. Somebody uses it. I don't need this data. And this is, again, this is, this is so much data that you're talking about terabytes. So just you, to, even to analyze it, you know, it will take forever. And I don't have access to this kind of computing power. But every data contains an important data. So, the, and, uh, and I'm sure, as we spoke a few moments ago about, you know, experts, you know, from around the world looking at the data, I'm sure they know how to extract important elements of the data. And also, I think it's, this is also a psychological element. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact is that your data is not safe. It you know, puts many Russian banks and Russian institutions in very disadvantaged position because yeah they are no longer safe so it's the and we're at war and uh, and at war every panic spreads faster so again I, a part of a material damage which i cannot assess now but it's I'm, obviously it's there there's also a psychological damage we can which which we can not assess exactly but we definitely understand the impact so there's the, the less and less confidence that Russian state can sustain this kind of attacks. And uh, it's, it also shows that Ukrainians or whoever is behind these attacks, anonymous, whoever, it just says, it's just, you know, it's found uh, Achilles Hill in Russian cyber defense. So we're, we're talking about a lot of different ways that information warfare is taking place and that war is changing in this new digital age. Another tool is cryptocurrency. We've seen that on one hand, it can be helpful in supporting Ukraine, but on the other hand, cryptocurrencies uh, can sort of get around some of the sanctions that are taking place in traditional financial institutions and might actually be able to support Russia in ways that are new. What are your thoughts on cryptocurrency and the role that it plays in warfare now? I believe in the future of crypto because I think that's the, we live in, in, in a world that is becoming increasingly digital and, uh, and so many elements of our life now are being moved to digital uh, uh, or there's a connection between digital and real world. And uh, it's very natural that we have new means of payment because at the end of the day, money is something that we believe in. It's dollar is dollar. It's, I mean, forget about gold. It's no longer about gold. We walked miles and miles historical miles away from the time where, you know, the, the currency had to be guaranteed by, by gold reserves, by, by precious metals. By, it's, it's about trust. Come on, it's the, today, what is dollar? I mean, it's just this, you look at American budget and you look at the overall debt, your global debt, you know, the, the derivatives. It's, I don't know, 25 times global GDP, I mean, this, we have so many black holes that every currency now, it's, it's, 
it's survived as long as we trust. So why not Bitcoin? Why, why, why not having crypto? Now, you raise an issue. Yeah, Russia maybe, actually maybe definitely, is using Bitcoins and other cryptos to evade sanctions. I was surprised. As long as money existed, you know, it, there were always, you know, those who, who made their fortune on, on illegal or shadow transactions. It's, it's not new. Um, and uh, crypto will offer opportunities for not only for Russia, but for all sorts of shadow regimes, uh, opaque financial institutions to do this new type of money laundering. They did it before. So that's again, it's, it's this is, do we have to fight it? Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's not, it doesn't mean that, you know, this, the crypto will secure all these transactions. We will fight them. Back. But unlike the past, unlike in the past, crypto offers an ordinary man or woman, an individual to do protected transactions. So I think when we look at the balance, it's like, you know, sword and shield. So pro and cons. I think that the crypto offers us so much better future. I've been working on, 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 on in the field of human rights. I'm a chairman of the Human Rights Foundation. And I can tell you, there's so many stories, you know, where people had, had no other ways of shifting funds in their country to support, not, not necessarily political campaign, educational programs. So they use crypto as a tool to boost uh, their agenda. I would say that, you know, we, we, while we, we, we have to discuss our reservations about crypto, and again, naturally, that's it's, it's paying attention to, to Russia's uh, new techniques of using crypto for, for, for this uh, uh, modern form of man laundering, I think we have to uh, agree that the potential benefits of crypto, an opportunity for individuals, whether they're trying to... to, to um, Secure the transactions in the environment that is very prohibitive for these kind of activities, like in, in Russia, by the way, back in Russia or in Afghanistan or in Iran, you name it, or an ordinary citizen of, in the free world who is really concerned about unlimited power of central banks to print new money, which means that, you know, this is what we have in our, in our saving account has been devalued. So we, you know, we have to be always, you know, open to ideas that will help individuals or group of individuals to build uh, the, 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 the resistance against any state actions, whether it's, you know, raising taxes or devaluing car currency. Again, it's a, it's a long list of um, money abuse that is called, you know, comprehensive financial policy uh, that hurts individuals. And again, it's, it's our, our chance to fight back and protect our interests. Naturally, there's no room for thousands and thousands of coins. And what we saw recently happened with Luna and, and Terra, you go back to the history of money, like, you know, South Sea bubbles. So this is bubbles, they, they get well part of any financial instrument. The moment you move from gold, 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 something, something really, you know, the, the, this is that you can touch, you know, this, and you, can, you cannot buy it. So, yeah. You have a lot of room for speculations, so that's why we we, we go through process. Process, I, in my view, is is of uh, correction. And again, thousands of coins, it's exaggeration. Few real, you know, coins, you know, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's ETH, and all connected car, uh, cryptos. I think it's 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 a reality that will be with us. And uh, and the fact is that now they are uh, dropping in value alongside with the market shows that there's already connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they lose probably more, but not, it's not so much more. It's basically, you see the, that they are, they are fluctuating with the same trends as, as the stock market, which means I think they psychologically, they have been already adopted by, by the big players as a part of this new financial environment. I think if we, if we look at cryptocurrencies, we have uh, different nations doing different things. So obviously China has banned it outright. Uh, Ukraine and Russia have obviously embraced it for the war. And now we're looking at the US uh, and Europe who are looking to regulate it. Do you have any thoughts on what kind of regulation is coming down the road for cryptocurrencies? Uh, I'm, I'm always skeptical about regulations because 
the idea of crypto, the idea of all the technologies that we use now, it's to enhance our individual freedom. And while, you know, I understand regulations are needed, we don't want just to, to live in a wild west or wild east. But it is always, we always have to think about a balance because an attempt to overregulate may kill the very, very idea. Why these accounts, you know, will be subject to regulation, which means still regulations, which means it's subject of, of taxation. Again, I'm happy to be taxes, you know, that's the way, you know, that's this. I have an account, it's registered, you know, I know that is part of my, you know, IRS declaration. Again, we all, uh, I, I know that. But why, you know, it's, it's unelected officials, you know, this is, that have other interests, you know, could have so much impact on what happens with my, with my, with my savings. Again, it's, it's, it's a balanced game. It's a balance. It's a, there's no chance that we will see the Chinese model. It's a joke. This is the, and we understand why Xi Jinping uh, 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 did it. It's same, you know, rejection of foreign influence. Same way they reject proper vaccines. That's why they have lockdowns because they use their just crappy vaccine and, uh, and they cannot accept the fact that the Western vaccines are much better. So it's the, and they wanted to have the, the, the digital yuan as the global currency. Okay, welcome. Be my guest. So just it's, uh, um, but you know, it's this, it's, there will, will be again, there will be some sort of regulated environment. Uh, I just hope it will be, it will be working better than GDPR. <laughs> so it's interesting to get your thoughts on these things because you've been, uh, you've done a really good job of predicting things that have actually come to fruition. So in your book, Winter is Coming, you predicted that Russia was going to invade Ukraine at scale. That's obviously happened. Um, curious of two things. One, what was the reaction that you received when you first made that prediction versus how are those same people reacting to the reality now? And then where is this all headed? What, are, what do you think is going to be the end result of this war? Okay. It will be a long, sad story if I start sharing, you know, responses to my predictions that I heard over these years. Yeah, there were some positive reviews, but you can just look at the review in New York Times or Washington Post, you know, to, to see the mood uh, of people who um, criticized me quite, you know, uh, aggressively because, you know, they, I think many of them looked at this book as, you know, my, you know, my, uh, it's an attack on Obama administration. So that's why from the left, you know, they were just most critical voices. They were, I, you know, I, I was confused by this kind of very narrow-minded response because I have a record of criticizing six consecutive administrations from Bush 41 to Joe Biden, three Democrats, <laughs> three Republicans. It was always about policies. So yeah, Obama happened to be in the office there and he had very... Uh, Feckless policies that led to to Putin led, led to Putin's aggression in Crimea in 2014, and made Putin believe that he could do whatever. But you know, then was Donald Trump, and uh, you can read what I what I said and wrote about about Donald Trump. Um, uh, I think that's the reason that that's it's the um, people didn't want to hear my warnings. It's just. The language of appeasement is much softer. It's nicer. And look, life is great, you know. Oh, we every year we have a new iPhone or a new Samsung. Every year we have a new conference that's that's unleashes some great technology. We have, you know, we have streaming uh, 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 technologies that allow us here to have everything on our screen. I mean, life is getting fun. Why are you telling us this bad news? Oh, Putin, yeah, Putin, maybe, maybe Putin. Putin is probably, okay. We give you a credit. Putin is a bad guy, but he will not start a war. It's just the idea that, you know, it's, it's Putin is ideologue. I mean, just, he lives in the past. And it's, and it's, it's, he will start a war, not because, you know, he is as he wants to grab something just, you know, on the ground. That's also, but it's not just this. It's war against our values. And that's the war that we saw before. And that's why I said reading books, history books, and I read quite a few of them helped. And I always said, yeah, thanks God, you know, but I would be wrong. But if I'm right, because I simply follow the pattern of his behavior, all I did is I was listening to what he said. And he was 
as every dictator before him. He always lies about what he has done. But he was very often, he was very open about what he was going to do. So I think the war was inevitable. For me, it was always not if, but when. Now, as of now, as we speak, the situation in the front line, on the front line is very, very hard, difficult, hard for Ukrainians because the weapons, the delivery of weapons is very slow. But it's not just about weapons. It's about cracks in the coalition. We see countries as big as France and Italy demanding Ukraine to capitulate. I think it's absolute shame. Ukrainians paid enormous uh, price in blood and they are dying every day defending our values. And, uh, and it's, that's what gives Putin confidence. And then you hear uh, other voices from New York Times to Henry Kissinger arguing for the same. It's just rewarding aggression. It's just, I mean, even Chamberlain probably would think it's too much. Um, now, I still believe Ukraine will win. It's important for us to think about this, the future world. So what it means, because, you know, we have been preoccupied with our fantasies about the future. And again, it's nobody denies the legitimacy of our concerns about climate change and other things, you know, social justice, you know, but you look at Ukraine and you understand it's, it's, there's a value of human life. Before we're talking about pursuit of happiness, it's life and liberty. And now life and liberty are just, you know, just it's at, it's at, at stake. And then you add, you know, the, the other radicals from the right talking about the past, glorifying the past. So I think it's time for us to concentrate on the, in, in the present. So it's just not to waste our energy for, for, uh, for arguing about the past and, uh, and uh, dreaming about the future. So and looking at what we can do now, because there's so much we can do, and, and that's why I'm a big fan of Elon Musk, for instance. It's time for us to dream, but not just, you know, just like fantasy, but, you know, dreams that related to, to um, expansion, whether it's intellectual expansion, whether it's a physical expansion. Okay, physical expansion means we have to fly to, 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 to uh, uh, Moon or, and Mars, but also we can expand physically down to the oceans. Yeah, we, we, we think that we, we are, we know everything about our planet, but Correct me if I'm wrong, I think the overall, overall knowledge of, of oceans is way under 5%. Yeah. So we still, again, it's, I want us to recover this spirit, spirit of pioneers. You know, this is to understand what is risk. And important thing from Ukraine, lessons from Ukraine, sacrifice. No, nothing happens without a sacrifice. And when we talk about, you know, our future dreams, we should remember, we have to make some sacrifices now. There's no, there's no free lunch. So the human, humanity always paid considerable price for, you know, reaching brighter future. And now I think this war in Ukraine teaches us that, you know, we all have to recover this old spirits of being pioneers, of taking risk, of making sacrifices. But again, I remain optimistic for a simple reason. I believe in the triumph of the free world, of triumph of the free mind. Because let's not forget, from China, we got virus. From America, we got vaccine. <laughs> Gary, thank you very much for everything. Uh, it's a really optimistic way to finish the conversation. Super informative. Um, it's just been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. And thank you for giving us your time and for, and for continuing to spread the awareness that's, that's rightfully needed thank at this time. So, and I see you at the conference. Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to seeing you in Toronto.